डियर फ्रेंड्स दिस इज ए पिक्चर ऑफ भक्त का वीरदास हु लिव बिटवीन थर्टीन नाइन्टी एट एंड फोर्टीन फिफ्टी एट इज ए फेमस सेंट पोइट हु रोड सेवरल वर्सेस पर्टिकुलरली ऑन लॉर्ड राम हेयर इज वन ऑफ हिज वर्सेस मालियावत देख के कलिया करी पुकार फूली फूली चुन लाई कल हो हमारी बार मीनिंग द गार्डर हैज कम लुकिंग एट हिम the flower birds in the garden are whispering to themselves oh look at that the totamali is taking all the flowers one by one and most likely our turn will be tomorrow isn't it everyone has to go when the turn comes my dear friends today i am going to present the topic peripheral arterial disease the entire presentation can be had from our website www.drsharma.in not only this several of our previous presentations and other interesting topics are available on the website please do visit our website peripheral arterial disease is also known as atherosclerosis obliterans the major pathophysiology of peripheral arterial disease is the chronic narrowing of the blood vessels of the lower limb particularly the lower limb due to atherosclerotic blocks and atherosclerotic process peripheral arterial disease remember is a cardiovascular time bomb why it is said so let us look at the diagnosis the differential diagnosis and the management risk factors of peripheral vascular disease and the larger context what does this peripheral arterial disease reflect in the body that is most important let us look at that the logo here and the punch lines are from the american association of cardiology and the american heart association websites remember legs for life pad or peripheral arterial disease is not just about your legs it is about our life because peripheral artery disease connotes a greater more significant cardiovascular disease the coronary artery disease And that is why it's not the question of your legs alone but it is a question of our life many of us think that if a patient complains of some leg pain we say okay you are tired it's normal you are aged all sorts of explanations we try to offer or we di- we diagnose sciatica arthritis or other diseases but we fail to look at another important cause of leg pain which is the vascular disease of the lower limbs remember leg pain is not normal at all this is what is the punch line of the vascular disease foundation save your legs that way you can save your life peripheral arterial disease pad here and after we will refer to this condition of peripheral arterial disease as pad for convenience pad is arterial disease of the non coronary arteries the causes could be atherosclerotic stenosis or thromboembolic occlusion or aneurysm due to weak wall aorta and its branches particularly the infradiaphragmatic part of the aorta and its branches are affected so peripheral arterial disease in general we mean aorta and its branches in the infradiaphragmatic part particularly the arteries involving the lower limbs which is a non coronary arterial what are the major arteries which are affected by pad the infradiaphragmatic part of the aorta and its major branches 
like the loyal and blood vessels renal arteries mesenteric arteries abdominal aorta itself in this talk we will try to focus our attention on the lower limb blood vessels and not talk too much about the renal artery peripheral arterial disease or mesenteric artery disease or abdominal aorta because these areas do not come into the purview of practitioners like us so it's more important for us to focus our attention on lower limb blood vessels peripheral arterial disease nonetheless the other territories are also important and it is important for us to recognize when such patient comes and confronts us so but let us focus on the pad related to lower limb blood vessels the pad how does it present what are the symptoms of the patient just like hypertension just like early stages of diabetes peripheral arterial disease to a great extent is asymptomatic that is all the more reason we should seek for the evidence of peripheral artery disease before the patient starts complaining look here 50% of the patients of pad do not complain of any symptoms they are asymptomatic among the other 50% of the people who are symptomatic only about 13% are treated the remaining 37% are untreated such is the nature of the problem and the patient has to be picked up quite by our imagination by our interest to look at that rather than waiting for the patient to complain something about his limbs why should we identify pad identifying pad means saving the life because pad is associated with increased cardiovascular risk 95% of the patients of pad have at least more than one cv risk factor there is a high prevalence of non fatal cardiovascular events in people who have pad there is increased propensity for fatal major acute coronary events mes in patients who have pad are this not enough reasons for us to identify pad and save the lives of our patients pad is not about the damage to the lower limbs alone pad signals greater damage of the vascular system as a whole look here patients of pad have got a relative risk of two times for chronic kidney disease three times relative risk for cerebrovascular disease six times relative risk for coronary artery disease if a patient has got pad he has got six times greater chance of having coronary artery disease that is why along with diabetes along with chronic kidney disease pad is classified as coronary artery disease equivalent let's recapitulate the anatomy of our lower limb blood vessels we have learned uh, about it in our anatomy classes now the aorta branches into the iliac artery the internal iliac artery then the femoral artery continues down onto the thigh the superficial branches of the femoral artery the gluteal branches of the femoral artery the profunda femoris continuing down as the popliteal artery which divides into two the anterior tibial artery occupying the anterior compartment of the leg and the posterior tibial artery going down into the leg and foot under the calf muscle and then the plantar arteries and the dorsal spadis artery on the dorsum of the foot these are the major blood vessels of the lower limb which can be palpated by our hand or auscultated with a stethoscope 
or explored using a Doppler ultrasound. So the superficial femoral artery, the profunda femoris, the popliteal, the anterior tibial, the posterior tibial, the dorsal spedis and the plantar arteries. Doctors, please stay in circulation. How? By taking steps to learn about PAD, recognizing PAD, investigating for PAD. This is a diagrammatic representation of the artery with the atherosclerotic plug there and subsequent narrowing. You can see there is about 75 percent narrowing of the artery here. So much so the blood flow to the limb down the course is affected. Here it is the atherosclerosis in the iliac artery on the left side that is shown in the picture. These are some diagrammatic representations of atherosclerotic plaque. The picture on the left hand side shows the normal blood vessel, normal flow, normal diameter, no narrowing and the limb showing the two areas where there is narrowing and the narrowed blood vessel is shown on the right part of the left picture with decreased blood flow, the atherosclerotic plaque and the cut section or the cross section of the narrowed artery is also shown. In the right hand side picture, we see the normal artery in the thigh region and when the plaque develops, what happens to the normal artery? Build up of fatty substances in the wall of the artery resulting in narrowing and atherosclerotic obstruction, atherosclerosis obliterans of the lower limb blood. The picture on the left hand side shows the aortic bifurcation, the diseased arteries, atherosclerosis represented there in the black color. A little lower down on the left side we see the iliac artery almost occluded totally by atherosclerotic process and collateral circulation has developed and that is keeping the limb alive. This happens many a time. Whenever there is a complete obstruction of the artery, slowly progressive, progressive narrowing, there will be development of collaterals and the collaterals will be feeding the limb nonetheless with reduced flow and reduced volume of blood. So, the limb is compromised. Arteries become narrowed and blood flow decreases due to atherosclerosis. Build up of fatty substances in the wall of the artery due to atherosclerotic plaque is the common pathogenesis for PAD. Now, the question is who should be tested for PAD? Is it that everyone who comes to our consultation should get an assessment for PAD? No. If the age of the patient is less than 50 years, then we must be looking for risk factors like diabetes and smoking which predispose for PAD. If the patient is either a diabetic or is a smoker plus one other CV risk factor under the age of 50 years, we are justified in screening them for PAD. In the age group between 50 and 69 years, we do not require any other risk factor. Diabetes alone or smoking alone is adequate for us to investigate for PAD. People who are 70 years and older, whether they have diabetes, or not, whether they are smokers or not, whether they, ha they have any CV risk factors or not, they must be invariably examined for peripheral arterial disease. In addition to the age restrictions and the groups described above, any patient who complains of lower limb pain with intermittent claudication or ischemic rest pain or who is a known case of coronary artery disease, cerebrovascular disease renal artery disease or who has got abnormal lower limb pulses must be examined thoroughly for peripheral arterial disease. Is that clear? What are the risk factors for PAD? They are not different from the risk factors for CAD or CVD or CKD. Male gender more propensity for PAD. 
एज मोर देन सिक्सटी ईयर्स मच मोर प्रोनाउंसड पी ए डी डायबिटीज वेरी स्ट्रॉन्ग रिस्क फैक्टर फॉर पी ए डी स्मोकिंग इज द मोस्ट इंपॉर्टेंट रिस्क फैक्टर फॉर पी ए डी हाइपर टेंशन डिसलाइपडेमिया ऑल्सो कॉन्ट्रीब्यूट टू पी ए डी इंक्रीज लेवल्स ऑफ टोटल होमोसिस्टीन आर रेग्युलरली फाउंड टू बी एसोसिएटेड विथ पी ए डी इवेन दो देर कारोलेशन विथ सी ए डी एंड अदर वैस्कुलर डिजीज is not well established for pad lot of literature is there that homocysteine increase causes more pad of course the ethnicity asians and africans are more prone for all sorts of atherosclerotic vascular disease particularly pad also high sensitivity crp is also a very important marker for pad renal insufficiency decreased gfr is also an added risk factor for pad it is imperative that we need to screen all our patients of pad for these risk factors cigarette smoking is found to be the strongest risk factor for peripheral arterial disease along with diabetes remember when one smokes a cigarette he is not only taking the nicotine into his body he is taking the combusted material of all the other chemicals that are listed here which surround the tobacco there in the packing of a cigarette the right hand side picture is an extensive thrombus of the aortic bifurcation opened up there and you can see the black material is the atherosclerotic plaque with the thrombus therein this is an autopsy specimen we can straight away say that all the cigarette cigarette smoke and the lipids have gone and clogged that particular aorta there in that patient what are the symptoms of pad just like we have angina due to coronary artery disease we have pain of the lower limbs we can call it as angina of the legs and if there is total occlusion and there is ischemia of the limb we can call it as instead of heart attack there this we can call it as leg attack okay exertional limitation of the lower limb patient will not be able to walk comfortably for reasonable distance for his age he has to stop before he continues the walking he experiences pain on walking or exertion and this is represented in the form of fatigue aching pain or numbness in the lower limbs these are the manifestations of angina of the leg intermittent claudication that is the patient goes to some distance stops there and then again takes rest starts continuing the walk and this rest walk rest walk cycle is constant for a period of time and this is what is called intermittent claudic claudication gradually the claudication distance will be reduced and the patient will not be able to walk the distance that he was earlier walking which is a sign that the arteries are getting further down narrow lower limb pain at rest is an ominous sign that means even without walking the patient is having pain something like unstable angina something like acute coronary syndrome lower limb rest pain is a significant finding saying that there is critical limb ischemia the most important question is does rest relieve your symptoms if he gets pain in the lower limb the rest is relieving it it is classical of peripheral arterial disease the symptoms of pad can be best described as the five p's what are the five p's pain pain in the lower limb precipitated by exertion relieved by rest pallor of the lower limb because of poor circulation the limb becomes pale may be cyanotic in the later stages pulselessness the pulses are either feeble are not palpable paresthesias and paralysis are ominous signs 
this to indicate that the degree of ischemia is very severe and the vaso nervorum is also affected that is the reason he is having paresthesias and paralysis of the lower early these are the five p's the common ones are the pain pallor and the pulselessness the critical limb ischemia or chronic patients of pad do have paresthesias and paralysis over the years chronic limb ischemia leads to some changes in the skin of the lower limbs what are the cutaneous changes atrophy of the skin the skin becomes atrophic and shiny alopecia particularly at the distal one third of the lower limb particularly in men if you see alopecia at the distal one third of the lower limb you have to suspect peripheral arterial disease in fact around 3 months ago i picked up a patient who came for the complaint of loss of hair of the lower part of the leg and when when we examined he has got classical pad brittle nails are another sign of pad dry scaly skin with atrophic changes occurs in the later stages of pad erythematous and pigmented skin also can be seen in acute limb ischemia when the limb is threatening to become gangrenous then of course it becomes very cold there is total absence of pulse the tissues die and become gangrenous so these are some of the classical skin changes but they are not present in all the patients they are advanced manifestations we should not wait for the skin changes to develop and then pick up pad by then it will be too late majority of the pad patients are asymptomatic can we identify the location of the pad depending on the presentation certainly yes depending on the muscles that are affected which show symptoms the location of stenosis can be inferred if the patient complains of pain in the buttocks pain in the hips and pain in the upper thighs associated with exertional onset of symptoms and relief by rest probably the lesion is in the aorta or the iliac artery if the lower limb pain is in the thigh and the calf muscles then femoral artery and its branches are affected if the intermittent claudication and the classical pain of pad is in the ankle and the foot most likely the popliteal artery or the tibial arteries either anterior or posterior tibial arteries are affected this is more or less similar to the way we inter- infer to the way in which we predict which particular part of the myocardium is damaged looking at which particular blood vessel is affected in the heart isn't it look at this bar chart as age advances from 60 years to 75 we see a tremendous increase in the occurrence of pad this is true both for men and women but in the age groups of less than 60 and 60 to 64 women are not that affected it's the men preponderance of the disease but age as age advances both women and men do succumb to peripheral arterial disease Fontaine has classified PAD into several clinical stages as stage 1 stage 2 3 and 4 what is stage 1 disease in stage 1 patient is totally asymptomatic he does not complain of rest pain or intermittent claudication there are no skin changes no symptoms or signs whatsoever 50% of the patients of PAD fall into this group the onus is on us to find out and bring out the disease in them and look for other vascular disorders depending on the age depending on the gender and depending on the history of diabetes or smoking or other vascular risk factor we have to suspect pad in them and try to look for and diagnose early and see that it does not progress stage 2 disease is 
there is mild pain to moderate pain with intermittent claudication and these are not cases which are beyond control these patients can be very well helped and we can have to pick them up at least in stage 2 and around 20 to 30 percent of the patients of PAD fall into this category. Stage 3 is ischemic pain of the lower limbs even at rest. Even when the patient is at rest, his pain, legs will be paining and of course the pain becomes worse on walking. And these patients already have very compromised circulation in the lower limbs. They have to be investigated thoroughly and they are around 10 to 30 percent of the people of peripheral vascular disease or peripheral arterial disease. And the stage 4 of course is a small proportion of patients are in stage 4 and these are people who have critical limb ischemia meaning the narrowing is very severe, very few drops of blood is trickling into the lower limb, there is a tendency for gangrene, they will be having all the clinical manifestations of a chronic PAD with skin changes and things like that and these are the people who require immediate identification and revascularization procedures to save the limb. Supposing we have diagnosed a patient with PAD and he is classified to have either stage 1, 2 or 3 disease, what is his prognosis going to be in the next 5 years? Stage 1 to 3 disease can have two types of problems. They will have some problems related to the limb and problems related to the coronary morbidity. CV morbidity, a larger context, the blood vessels of the entire body being affected. Among the lower limb morbidity, 70 percent of them, stage 1 to stage, stage 3 disease in 5 years will be stable with intermittent claudication. Twenty percent of them will have intermittent claudication which is going from bad to worse and worse to worse. And the ten percent of the people remaining will have critical limb ischemia in the course of five years. When we come to the CV morbidity, twenty percent of these patients of stage one to three will have non-fatal coronary vascular event. Remember, 20 percent of the PAD patients in 5 years are going to have non-fatal coronary vascular event like myocardial infarction, acute coronary syndrome, unstable angina, whatever it is. And 30 percent of the people of stage 1 to 3 the next 5 years are going to die either due to PVD or due to CVD. Isn't that very important to pick up PAD because in 5 years 30 percent of the people are dying, 20 percent of the people are having coronary vascular events and 10 percent are having critical MB ischemia, 20 percent are going from worsening of the intermittent claudication. So, it is imperative for us to pick up PAD as early as possible. What is the prognosis and one year outcome of a patient of critical limb ischemia? Critical limb ischemia patients, 25 percent of them will end up in CV mortality in the next one year. 25 percent of them will have one of their limbs amputated. Only 50 percent of the patients of CLI, that is the stage 4 PAD, will be alive with both the limbs intact and walking at the end of one year. It is amazing that if we miss to pick up PAD, we end up in CLI and if one has got CLI, his mortality, CV mortality and amputation rates are very high and the chances of he having a life with two limbs is restricted to less than 50 percent. This is a Kaplan Meyer survival curve of PAD. Look at the topmost curve in this graph, they are normal subjects. At the end of 10 to 12 years, around 90 percent of them are alive. People who have asymptomatic PAD, around 55 to 60 percent of them only are alive by 10 to 12 years. People who have symptomatic PAD, 
less than 40 percent of them only are alive by 10 to 12 years. With severe symptomatic PAD, around 20 percent of them only are alive by 10 years. These are the survival rates of people with PAD. So, to reiterate, what are the key symptoms of PAD? Exertional limitation of the lower extremity muscles, fatigue, aching, numbness or pain in the buttock, thigh, cough or foot, depending on the artery that is affected. Poorly healing wounds of the legs and feet, pain at rest localized to the lower leg or foot associated with upright position. Postprandial abdominal pain provoked by eating and is associated with weight loss, a sign of mesenteric artery PAD. Family history of abdominal aortic aneurysm also predisposes people for PAD. What are the important signs of PAD? We have to record blood pressure in both the arms and legs and note the inter limb asymmetry. Palpation of the carotid pulses, brachial and radial ulnar pulses is important. More importantly, palpation of femoral, popliteal, dorsal spidis and posterior tibial pulses. Allen's test for hand perfusion if we suspect upper limb ischemia. Palpation of the abdomen for aortic pulsations of aneurysm. Bruise can be heard on the carotids, on the abdomen, in the flank, on the renal arteries and in the femoral arteries. The pulse can be classified as absent being 0, 1 being diminished, 2 as normal, 3 being bounding pulse. Foot examination for changes in color, temperature, ulcerations, hair loss, trophic changes and hypertrophic nails have to be done and these have to be recorded. The picture on the left hand side shows the pulse wave recorder. We use a spigma manometer curve and inflate the curve and obstruct the artery. After occluding the artery, slowly release the pressure on the artery and record the pulsations and the pulse wave pattern using a Doppler and these signals are transformed into a recording on a graph paper like an ECG. But more commonly, we will be doing ankle brachial index. This also uses a vascular Doppler and the picture on the right hand side shows the position of the cuffs for recording ankle brachial index. We will see a little later the details of how to record ABI, ankle brachial index and how to interpret it. Ankle brachial index also called ABI. This is an index comparing the blood pressure of the ankles with the blood pressure of the brachials. This is the single most important easily executable bedside test for detecting not only peripheral vascular disease for detecting vascular integrity. ABI is not a marker of peripheral vascular disease alone. It is a marker of the much larger vascular disease, the coronary artery disease. So, what are the uses of ABI? ABI is a predictor of coronary vascular disease. It is a screening tool to diagnose vascular health and also the peripheral arterial disease. It is a diagnostic tool to confirm peripheral arterial disease. It is a monitoring tool to see whether the patient has improved or not after you give him some intervention for the peripheral vascular disease. It is a prognostic tool by which we can say how the limb healing will go, how the, how the ulcers will heal, whether a particular patient's limb is getting worse, whether there are chances and need for any revascularization procedure, all these can be prognosticated using the simple index called the ABI. Now we have to learn how to record ABI and how to interpret this particular simple index. This slide is about the measurement of ABI. Look at the picture there. The picture shows the positioning of the blood pressure cuffs on the right arm, left arm, right leg and the left leg. Remember in the legs 
we have to tie the cuffs below the calf muscles and not on the calf muscles and we will be examining in the lower limb either the posterior tibial artery or the dorsal spinous artery in the upper limbs of course we examine the brachial artery what we need to do is first keep the doppler vascular doppler 5 msz pro on the brachial artery or the dorsal spinous artery whichever is the case and then hear the signals audible signals of the doppler inflate the cuff beyond the systolic pressure then slowly deflate the cuff and appearance of sounds in the doppler is to be recorded as the systolic pressure first in the right arm then in the left arm then in the right leg and then in the left leg and these are put in a tabular form and each reading is taken twice and whichever is the higher reading that is taken as the reading of that particular arm now the question of calculation right sided abi is equal to the higher right ankle pressure we would have recorded two pressures either from the dorsal spinous or the posterior tibial two readings take the right higher ankle pressure and divide it by the higher arm pressure this could be either the right arm or left arm because we want it to titrate the limb versus the best circulation of the arm so high higher arm pressure is the denominator for left abi higher left ankle pressure divided by the higher arm pressure remember once the patient comes we have to give him enough rest of 10 minutes in a warm room never record abi in a cold chilling air conditioned room because the blood vessels tend to get constricted in in a colder environment so give him a normal room temperature room and 10 minutes of rest so that any anxiety exertion other things are brought down use the vascular doppler probe of 5 mhz take two readings each in in uh, all the four limbs take the higher reading as the recording and then calculate the abi as per the description given above interpretation of ankle brachial index if the ankle brachial index is greater than 1.3 that means the ankle pressure is much much higher than the brachial pressure this shows that the arteries of the lower limb have become so rigid and they are non compressible then we have to use other measures of finding out limb ischemia normally the abi value will be around 1 almost the same blood pressure in the upper and lower limbs anywhere between 0.91 to 1.29 we can call it as normal value of abi if the value is less than 0.9 but more than 0.4 0.9 to 0.4 the diagnosis of pad is confirmed we do not require any other test to confirm the diagnosis but of course we need a test to know the location of the occlusion and to plan any endovascular treatment otherwise the diagnosis of pad stops short there if the abi is less than 0.4 saying that the ankle blood pressure is not even 40% of the brachial blood pressure then that is critical limb ischemia and such a patient must be immediately referred to the vascular surgeon for urgent endovascular prevascularization procedures once we suspect and diagnose pad by using ankle brachial index we have to evaluate the patient for the health of the other vascular trees like the coronary artery disease cerebral vascular disease renal artery disease and the retina that is looking at the fundus examination of all the pulses the carotids the upper limb pulses especially the lower limb pulses ankle brachial index of course we have already done or the toe brachial index in patients who have non compressible arteries with an abi of greater than 
then we have to do what is called toe brachial index. Resting ACG exercise treadmill test. Exercise treadmill test here it is done not to pick up coronary artery disease alone, but to pick up the limb ischemia related to the exertion. The patient goes on the exer bike or the exercise treadmill, he develops intermittent claudication and pain and that will diagnose at peripheral arterial disease. CBC, GTT to rule out or confirm diabetes, HbA1c to look at the control of diabetes, lipid profile to know dyslipidemia, creatinine and MEAU to know about the vascular health of the kidney. Imaging, imaging of the lower limb arteries is required in some patients where we, in whom we plan revascularization processes. Carotid duplex scan can also be done if we find out that there is carotid territory ischemia and like carotid intima media thickness for carotid vascular disease and cerebral vascular disease. Assessment for CAD should be complete because PAD means an underlying CAD already existing and the need for coronary angiogram should be carefully evaluated. Here is the list of differential diagnosis of PAD. Patients who have lower limb pain must be suspected of PAD important. Nevertheless, other causes like nerve root compression, spinal canal stenosis, inflammatory and arthritic pain, symptomatic back cysts of the popliteal area, hip joint diseases, entrapment neuropathies, venous claudication like DVT and venous thromboembolism have to be thought of and suspected and ruled out. Of course, evaluation for PAD goes side by side along with the evaluations for ruling out other diseases. These are pictures of foot ulcers in a case of severe peripheral arterial disease. In this particular patient, he has developed a very big ischemic ulcer on the lateral border of the foot, which over a period of time after correcting the ischemia and treating the ulcer, started healing as you can see in the left side second picture. And finally, in the right side picture, the bone has totally healed. Around 6 centimeters of a scar is left there at the end of healing. This is an extreme case of foot ulceration in peripheral artery. Here are some more pictures of ischemic foot ulcers. The upper left hand picture is a plantar ulceration of the foot due to ischemia. The lower picture on the left hand side shows ischemic ulceration with early gangrenous changes on the big toe. On the right hand side, the upper picture shows typical punched out ischemic ulcer of the second toe with shiny red skin. The lower picture shows ischemia with interdigital ulcerations and pallor of the foot with brittle nails and very pale nails also with slight gangrenous changes on the big toe. In severe cases of PAD where the limb circulation is compromised, ischemia of the distal parts of the foot develops with ischemic foot ulcerations which will lead to necrosis and depth of the tissue there and formation of gangrene. You can see the lateral border of the foot is involved in this patient which who is showing wet gangrene associated with secondary infection. These are some more changes of the feet due to peripheral arterial disease. The upper left hand picture is a healing vascular ulcer due to peripheral artery disease around 4 to 5 centimeters with associated skin changes. This is another similar patient on the left hand side, lower part of the picture with dermatological changes like atrophy, erythema and then ulceration of the skin. The right hand side upper picture 
is what is called the champagne bottle appearance of the foot. This occurs in severe limb ischemia where the distal part of the limb is atrophied with ulceration whereas mm, the upper part of the limb the calf and the limb above looks normal and this gives an appearance of a champagne bottle. In the lower right hand picture is again ischemic foot ulcers with redness, erythema, punched out uh, ulcers uh, which are very typical of lower limb ischemic ulcers. For patients who have severe degrees of peripheral arterial disease, we not only do an ankle brachial index, we need to look at the arterial tree using an arterial Doppler study and this is a picture on the left hand side showing recording of the arterial Doppler uh, on, the, on a patient with peripheral arterial disease. On the right hand side we see a patient with uh, PAD and gangrene of the big toe and almost the toe is uh, constricted in such a way that the gangrenous part is about to fall off because of severe ischemia of the tip of the big toe. Now, how do we differentiate foot and leg ulcers? We know that foot and leg ulcers can be due to arterial causes, can be due to venous causes, can be due to neuropathy, can be due to skin infections. Here is a tabular form for us to look at the foot ulcers carefully and clinically itself we will be able to decide is it an arterial ulcer, is it a venous ulcer, is it a neuropathic ulcer. In arterial ulcers the cause is peripheral arterial disease. In venous ulcers the cause is deep venous thrombosis or venous varicosities. Skin infections due to hypertension and embolism can also produce ulcers. Neuropathic ulcers are due to the vaso nervorum being affected. In arterial disease, the location is in the toes and the foot which are farthest from the heart, farthest from the supply of blood. In the venous system, the commonest site of ulceration is malleolar region, either the lateral malleolus or the medial malleolus. Skin infections due usually occur in the lower one third of the leg. Neuropathic ulcers are on the sole of the foot and not on the dorsum or in the lower leg. Pain is a classical feature of arterial ulcer, a very severe pain with characteristic intermittent claudication. Whereas the pain of the venous ulcer is mild boring pain. Skin infarcts also produce very severe pain but it is very acute in its presentation. Neuropathic ulcers, needless to say, they are painless. The appearance of the ulcer in an arterial ulcer, it is irregular with pink base. In a venous ulcer, it is again irregular with blue base. In skin infarcts, the small multiple ulcers are seen. In neuropathic ulcers are deep, even up to the bone depth and they are infected. These are the classical features of different presentations of lower limb ulcers. Of course, a patient may have a combination of these diseases and a combination of these presentations can occur. How do we distinguish a neuropathic limb ulcer from an ischemic limb ulcer? Already we have seen in the previous slide some of, some of this information. Neuropathic limb ulcers are painless ulcers who are red in appearance with normal pulses typically punched out often on the sole or margins of the foot. There will be calluses on the foot, there will be bony deformities. Sensory impairment is present or sensation may be absent. The foot is dry, warm foot with dilated veins. Versus an ischemic limb ulcer which is very painful, intermittent claudication, pale limb or cyanotic limb. Decreased or absent pulses, irregular margins common on the toes, calluses and bony deformities are absent, variable degrees of sensory findings. If the limb ischemia is severe, paresthesias and sensory findings may be there. Otherwise, usually sensory disturbances are not seen. The feet are cold due to lack of proper blood supply and the veins are collapsed because there is no inflow through the arteries.
what are the different diagnostic tools we have to diagnose vascular disease of the lower limbs or PAD? ABI, which we have already seen, is the quickest, cheapest bedside test to diagnose and confirm peripheral arterial disease. The limitation of ABI is it cannot localize and say whether the obstruction is in the femoral artery or in its superficial branches or in the popliteal artery or the dorsal or in the anterior tibial artery or in the posterior tibial artery. The TBI trabrachial index is utilized whenever the ABI is more than 1.3 that signifies the arteries are non-compressible. In such a situation we cannot get an idea about the PAD then we have to resort to toe brachial index wherein we compare the blood flow in the toes to the blood flow in the brachials. Toes blood vessels are usually not that rigid and they are compressible. So toe brachial index can be elicited but it requires a special equipment uh, to decard toe brachial index. PVR pulse volume re recording is a method of using the volume rec wave recorder and it is uh, useful in critical limb ischemia and particularly in monitoring the revascularization procedures that are done. Duplex ultrasound. What is duplex ultrasound? In duplex ultrasound we send two signals of ultrasound. One to get the static picture of the anatomy of the blood vessels. The other one is a Doppler ultrasound signal to get the dynamicity of flow in the blood vessels. So using the information from both the ultrasound signals that is the Doppler signal and the static ultrasound signal uh, we get a picture of the artery uh, along with the flow pattern, the severity, the location and the pressures in the arteries can be identified. Of course the gold standard is the conventional angiography of the blood vessels of the lower limb by injecting a dye and taking pictures or MR angiogram can also be done which is reasonably uh, good as I mean almost similar to conventional angio but only problem with them is their invasive angio procedure and MR is costlier but they are required only in cases which are, which, which, uh, are planned for revascularization and they are definitive procedures. Unless we are thinking in terms of revascularization, either grafting or endovascular procedure, there is no indication to submit our patient to either angiography or MR angio of the lower limbs. In the previous slide, we have discussed several tests for peripheral vascular disease. Not all the tests are required for everyone with PAD. Then which test is required for whom? In patients of stage 1 who have asymptomatic lower limb peripheral arterial disease, ankle brachial index alone is sufficient to make a diagnosis and start on the workup and treatment. If the patient has stage 2 disease and stage 3 disease with increasing limb ischemia, intermittent claudication, then of course we are justified in trying to localize where exactly is the obstruction. In such a case, not only we do ABI, we do a pulse volume recorder and then we use a duplex ultrasound. In patients who have got abdominal aortic aneurysm, ultrasound of the abdomen, CT of the abdomen, MR angiogram of the aorta will be required. Of course, in patients who have grade 4 disease or stage 4 disease with the critical limb ischemia or acute limb ischemia, wherein we want to revascularize the procedures of choice are of course MR angiography and conventional angiogram after injecting a dye. Between the two angiogram is preferable because surgeon always wants a definite angiographic pattern and picture before he takes up a patient for operation. So this is how we tailor our tests for the different types of PAD patients we see depending on the clinical stage in which they are. The algorithm of treatment for PAD follows into the four major categories. Asymptomatic patient with PAD or with atypical leg pain not classical of PAD. Nonetheless he has got established PAD 
as defined by the ankle brachial index less than 0.9. What is the treatment in him? The second group of patients are patients who have got intermittent claudication, symptomatic PAD, diagnosis and treatment of such cases is slightly different. Then of course we have patients who are diagnosed with critical limb ischemia and the treatment of them is of course very different. And there are another group of patients who have acute limb ischemia due to thromboembolic complications of the lower limb or due to aneurysms of the lower limb blood vessels which threaten the limb ischemia suddenly. In them, the treatment protocol is slightly different. Okay, what is the key treatment plan of a patient of peripheral arterial disease? Certainly, we have to look at the risk factors and start modifying the risk factors. That would be the primary concern of a physician like us. To treat a peripheral arterial disease is to treat the vascular tree as a whole. Risk factors, smoking, behavioral treatment, nicotine replacement therapy, bupropion, verniclin, the new year drug for control of smoking or for cessation of smoking. Diabetes mellitus, strict control of diabetes, keeping the A1C under 7%. Most important thing in a diabetic is a diabetic foot care. Diabetic patient, not only he has got PAD, he has got diabetic neuropathy also. He has got diabetes related foot infections. They have to be taken care of. Lipid control, LDL should be kept to less than 70 milligrams. Use statin as the first agent, if necessary, fibrate and niacin may be added. Hypertension must be treated, keep the blood pressure around 120 to 120 by 80. Yes inhibitors and ARBs are the first choices. CCBs can be used, but never use beta blockers, because beta blockers by themselves, they constrict the peripheral arteries. In a patient with peripheral arterial disease, we should not give beta blockers. Antiplatelet agent must be given in all cases of peripheral artery disease because there is already an underlying vascular damage. Aspirin or clopidogrel can be used, but combination is not required. Anticoagulants for critical limb ischemia, for severe life-threatening ischemia of the limb, we have to use heparin, low molecular weight heparin and not oral anticoagulants. If the patient is found to have increased homocysteine, folic acid and cobalamin can be given, but of course the evidence is class 3 and we are not very sure whether these agents are going to be of really any great benefit. Nonetheless, in patients with homocysteine elevation, these agents can be tried. We have seen the treatment for the first group of patients of asymptomatic PAD. In them, identifying the associated risks of other vasculature and modifying the cardiovascular risk factors forms the main stay of treatment and regular follow-up of the patient for symptoms of PAD for intermittent claudication for the progress of the disease is essential. And the second group of patients who are symptomatic PAD with, with intermittent claudication, the treatment resolves around modifying the risk factors plus addition of certain pharmacological agents. Silostrazol, a new drug which is found to be highly beneficial for PAD given in a dose of 100 milligrams BID is the most effective drug. The only contraindication for this drug is active congestive heart failure. This is available and marketed by Sandoz in our country. Pentoxifilin available as Trentol or Flexitol, different brand names are there, which is a hemorrhological agent which increases the blood flow, can also be tried in a dose of 400 milligrams three times a day. But of course, this is a second line drug and a better drug would be Silestrozol. If Silestrozol is not available or not given because of CHF, one can safely give pentoxifilin.
there are several drugs which are promoted for peripheral vascular disease like l arginine l carnidine jingo biloba oral prostaglandins like a baraprost iloprost etc all these drugs are found to be not effective in pad even if any representative of the company promotes them please tell them that these are not useful and don't use them vitamin e is found to be of no use in peripheral vascular disease likewise edta also has been tried in some trials and in fact it is found that it should not be used in the patient of pad within stage 2 and 3 who has got intermittent claudication or ischemic breast pain in addition to the pharmacological agent silastrozole or pentoxifilin we have to offer him and educate him to exercise this exercise and rehabilitation forms the main stay of treatment of second and third stages of peripheral arterial disease what is this exercise program a warm up and cooling down time of 5 to 10 minutes to be taken either a treadmill walking or track walking has to be prescribed not resistance walk or resistance exercise intensity of the exercise or walking should induce moderate pain in the limbs exercise rest exercise pattern patient exercises for walks for 5 minutes takes 1 minute 2 minutes rest then again goes for 5 minutes walk 2 minutes rest like that over a period of 35 to 50 minutes he should have exercised around 25 to 30 minutes exercise program should be done 3 to 5 days in a week exercise should be fully supervised because these patients might end up in some sort of complication during the exercise careful watch should be kept on the cardiac signs and cad improvement is much better with exercise rehabilitation program than with drug treatment alone so it's important to put all patients on stage 2 and stage 3 on exercise and rehabilitation even stage 1 patients should be encouraged to have good physical activity and regular walking that way they can prevent progression of their disease from stage 1 to stage 2 or 3 in patients of pad who have stage 3 disease or critical limb ischemia stage 4 above treatment with pharmacological agents risk modification and exercise program will not be sufficient such patients require endovascular treatment lifestyle limiting disability severe intermittent claudication ischemic rest pain no improvement with exercise or pharmacological agents favorable risk benefit ratio of the procedure has to be established the procedures of choice are iliac femoropopliteal lesions have to be tackled 50 to 75% of the stenosis is to be there to undertake endovascular treatment this has to be demonstrated by pressure gradients stenting of the arteries etherectomy cutting balloons are used to treat such cases thermal devices lasers and stents are useful only in the iliac artery lesions remember doctor there are no prophylactic endovascular procedures if a patient has got stage 1 peripheral arterial disease do not subject him for a bypass or iliopopliteal uh, endovascular procedure or iliofemoral um endovascular procedure such procedures should not be undertaken unless there is an indication the diagram on the left hand side demonstrates how a balloon angioplasty is done look at the picture there the erythematous blood vessel the red colored balloon is inserted there the erythema is cleaned up and the passage of the tube is widened and sometimes these balloons will have what are called the laser assisted balloons and there will be etherectomy done using the balloons 
In other words, sometimes endovascular procedure, if it is not possible, we have we may have to do a bypass, just like we do a coronary bypass. Look at the picture on the right hand side. There is an obstruction at the level of the popliteal artery on the left lower limb, and this patient has undergone has undergone a bypass graft, femoral popliteal bypass graft has been put to bypass the blocked part of the femoral artery, popliteal artery. For stage 4 disease with critical limb ischemia, there could be a problem with the inflow of blood in the blood vessels higher up in the lower limb or there could be a problem in the outflow of the blood in the lower down in the lower limb. Surgery for the inflow problems, preoperative CV risk evaluation is a must. IRTO bifemoral bypass, IRTO iliac, IRTO femoral bypass, iliac endarterectomy, femoro femoral bypass, axillo femoral bypass are some of the procedures for inflow improvement. Surgical procedures for outflow improvement. Femoral above knee popliteal vein or prosthetic bypass, femoral below knee popliteal vein or prosthetic is used for bypass, femoral tibial vein or prosthetic used, composite sequential bypass, femoral tibial blind segment bypass, profunda plasty, these are some of the procedures for outflow improvement. For patients with combined inflow and outflow problems, First, the in inflow problem has to be corrected before the patient is taken up for a procedure for the outflow problem. Acute limb ischemia due to thromboembolic complications of the lower limb blood vessels. Intraarterial thrombolytic therapy is the mainstay of treatment for acute limb ischemia. The advantages are it is a low risk alternative to open surgical removal of the embolus. There is no need to delineate the vascular anatomy. Clearing intraarterial thrombus enhances the long-term patency of the vessel and thereby the limb. Over the past 10 years, volumes and volumes of literature has piled up on peripheral arterial disease. Different international organizations are taking interest in this particular problem because it is a marker of a more severe vascular problem in the body, the coronary artery disease. Peripheral artery disease is a, being approached by different organizations. There is one organization called the PAD coalition or peripheral arterial disease coalition. Remember doctor, in the next five years, one in four of your patients with peripheral arterial disease will suffer either a heart attack or a brain stroke or an amputation of his limb or he may die. There is a 25% of chance that a patient of peripheral arterial disease today will have one of these major cardiovascular events in the next five years. It is we, we only can change this scenario by identifying all patients of peripheral arterial disease and putting them on risk modification strategy and the appropriate exercise program and pharmacological treatment. Isn't it important for all of us to realize that the emergency that we face as far as PAD is concerned, PAD is not alone about the limb, it is about the vascular health. The most important vascular event that we all dread and fear is the current day vascular event and that is very well predicted by the peripheral arterial disease. For those who are interested in additional reading, this is the list of resources that you can consult on the internet. Most importantly, www.legdisorders.org is a website, an interactive website, which gives everything about leg disorders, not only peripheral arterial disease. There are other websites like medscape.com or emedicine.com or nhlbi.nh.gov which have a lot of content on peripheral vascular disease. So, please look at these websites and get more enriched with information thereon. This entire presentation is based mainly 
on the PAD guidelines published in the last reference listed here. This is a 150 page guideline published by the ACC, American College of Cardiology and jointly with the American Heart Association. I went through the guidelines step by step and this presentation is a summary of what is presented in those guidelines. You can have a detailed look at those guidelines and that is provided to you along with the CD. Look at this picture. The Almighty is only one. We may call him by different names. Hindus may call him Rama. Muslims may call him as Allah. Christians may call him as Christ. And of course, the Sikhs may call him as Nanak or whatever is the God that they call. But remember, Almighty is Govind Bolo Gopal Bolo Shivadev Bolo Ramnam Bolo Govind Bolo Gopal Bolo Shivadev Bolo Ramnam Bolo Allah Malik Yeshu Nanak Allah Malik Yeshu Nanak Ye Naam Sare Jeevan Sare Ye Naam Sare Jeevan Sare Jo Naam Chaho Wo Naam Bolo Jo Naam Chaho Wo Naam Bolo Ye naam sare jeevan sare Jo naam chaho wo naam bolo Lekin Prem se mano dhyan se jano Prem se mano dhyan se jano We have seen the picture of the great master Kabir Das in the opening slide of this presentation. This wonderful song is written by Kabir Das. It teaches us the message of universal brotherhood and the message of harmony between the different religions. It says worship Govind or Gopal or Lord Shiva or Ram's name. It matters not. Or maybe you worship Allah, Malik, Yesu, or Nanak. All are one and the same. Different names by which we call our favorite God. In the journey of life, all do help. Whatever form we are fond of, we can take refuge in Him in that form. But it's important for us to remember and do that worship with love and with perfect focus and attention. And that, in a way, is the best message that we can take home on this particular presentation. And we can extend the same idea into our disease, the peripheral artery disease, we can see in the next Look at these, the diseases of the cardiovascular system presenting in one patient as coronary artery disease, in another as chronic kidney disease, yet another patient presents as peripheral arterial disease. Some more patients present as cerebrovascular disease, be it CAD, PAD, CVD, or CKD all talk about the cardiovascular health. They all tell us about the disseminated atherosclerosis that is going on in the body. That way, picking up any one of them must give us enough thought and compel us to look for other vascular systems of the body. So much so, 
identifying a patient is to be treated as a red alert for other circuits a warning a strong warning to imperatively look at the other vascular health of coronary cerebral vas vessels and the kidneys and so on this is a parody of the song that we have seen from kabir das si edi bolo si ke edi bolo pi edi bolo si vi edi bolo si edi bolo si ke edi bolo pi edi bolo si vi edi bolo ye naam sare ye khi bimari ye naam sare ye khi bimari yam ye yu ye bi e c g c e g ye test sare jeevan bachare jo naam dekho सब नाम पूछो जो नाम देखो सब नाम पूछो लेकिन जल्दी ही जानो आगे ही पकड़ो जस्ट टू गिव एन इंटरप्रिटेशन ऑफ दट पर्टिकुलर फेरेडी सॉन्ग विच आई जस्ट सॉन्ग कॉल इट सी ए डी और सी के डी or call it pad or call it cvd all of them are but only one melody do microalbuminuria ankle brachial index ecg or coronary angiogram all these tests give us information to save the lives of our patients and our sex but remember whatever form we see these diseases either as cad or ckd or pad or cvd we cannot ignore the other circuits we have to investigate very early in the disease and start the risk modification so that we can save the damage to the entire vascular tree this is the crux of the message of this presentation on pad so friends let us conclude by reiterating the fact that pad is not for legs alone save the legs save the limbs suspect pad in every patient of above 50 60 years in all smokers in all diabetics in people who have more than one cv risk factor pad most of the cases it is asymptomatic unless we look for it we will not be able to detect it should not we should not wait till the patient comes with complaints of leg pain intermittent claudication rest pain there are advanced stages of the disease nothing much can be done once the disease advances pad is a marker of the vascular health of the body patients of pad will definitely have problems in the other vascular circuits particularly the coronary vascular disease it is important for us to diagnose pad and to extrapolate that information to investigate other vascular beds the treatment of pad is basically in stage 1 risk modification in stage 2 risk modification plus exercise program in stage 3 risk modification exercise program not giving the desired effect with pharmacological agents then endovascular procedures and then surgical procedures like bypass can be considered acute limb ischemia chronic limb ischemia must be thoroughly investigated immediately and sent to vascular surgeon for required surgical procedures again and again telling the fact that whether it is pad or cad or cvd or ckd 
it is we are talking of only one disease the vascular health or vascular disease so with that concept in mind let us close today's presentation thank you all very much once again thank you